Well, aloha everyone and welcome to Unit 2 of Bio 101 here at Chaminade University. Today we're going to be talking about atoms, molecules, and life. We'll start off talking about atoms, which are the smallest form of an element that still retain the properties of that element. We'll talk about how atoms interact with each other to create molecules and how molecules are so important for life. Specifically, we'll be talking about water and why water is so important for life today. So atoms are going to be the smallest unit of an element that retains all the chemical properties of that element. And an element is defined as a substance that can't be broken down into anything simpler. Elements under normal conditions cannot be transformed into other substances. And all matter is formed by elements either alone or in combination with other elements. We have 92 naturally occurring elements and many more that we can induce artificially. But the top six that we're going to see on this list are the ones that we're going to be discussing primarily for the purposes of Bio 101. We're going to be talking about oxygen and hydrogen when we talk about water. We're going to be talking about carbon when we talk about biomolecules because carbon forms the backbone for all of the biomolecules. Uh, we'll be talking about carbon, hydrogen, oxygen working together as well as nitrogen. Sometimes we'll talk a little bit about calcium, phosphorus, and some of these other trace elements here. But in general, we're going to be talking about these top guys here. And if you look at the percentage of weight by the human body, oxygen is going to be number one, where it's 65% of the human body is going to be comprised of oxygen. Um, almost 20% by carbon, almost 10% by hydrogen. Um, nitrogen and calcium and phosphorus at least get the single digits. Everything after that is just going to be what we call um, well, trace elements and elements that are under 1% by weight in the human body. Now, there's a couple of different things that we're going to look at when we look at atoms. We'll be looking at their atomic number, we'll be looking at their mass number, we'll be looking at their atomic weight, and this can be kind of confusing, so I'm going to walk you through that in just a little bit. But before we get there, let's talk about what atoms are comprised of. So atoms are not the absolute smallest unit, they're just the simple, but all atoms are comprised of subatomic particles, which are going to share amongst all atoms. So atoms actually the simplest unit of the element that are going to retain the properties of that element, and when you break it down further, it no longer retains the properties of that element. Those three subatomic particles are going to be protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now we have an atomic nucleus, which is basically the center of the atom, and then we have an orbit around that nucleus. The atomic nucleus is going to be comprised of protons and neutrons. Protons are positively charged. Neutrons have no charge at all. Um, and electrons, which are going to be orbiting around the nucleus, are going to be negative. So an atom walks into a bar and he says to the bartender, I think I've lost an electron. And the bartender says, are you sure? And the atom says, I'm positive. That's my terrible dad joke of the day, but my point is that um, electrons carry positive and negative charges. But overall, they're generally, I'm sorry, electrons carry negative charges, atoms carry positive and negative charges in the form of protons and electrons. Um, but overall, they're electrically neutral because the number of positive protons and the amount of negative electrons is going to be equal. So if you look at the three subatomic particles on the left, we have neutron, proton, and electron. Only neutrons and protons are going to have any what we call atomic mass. For the purposes of our class, electrons don't carry any atomic mass at all. Um, and neutrons don't have any charge, but protons and electrons do. So protons have one mass and one charge, positive one charge. Neutrons mass but no charge. Electrons no mass but negative charge. All right, so the mass number of the atom is basically going to be the additive total, so the total mass of the number of protons and the number of neutrons that are contained in the nucleus. And because these are generally going to be equal, these are going to be, um, <clears throat> they're going to be equal to the mass number. I apologize when you add them up. The atomic nucleus is going to be formed by the protons and neutrons that are found in the center of the atom, and then again, around that, the electrons are going to be rapidly orbiting. Now, again, the electrons are not factored into the mass number because electrons carry such a small atomic weight that they're not going to be added in, but they are going to be added into the charge. The number of protons and, um, in the nucleus is known as the atomic number. So hydrogen atoms only have one proton, so they're going to have an atomic number of one. And the atomic number is actually one of the defining elements, defining values of each element. So for example, carbon has six protons and oxygen has eight protons. Now, atoms have a little bit of variability, so we do have very variable atomic forms of particular elements, and those are called isotopes. You may have heard of radioactivity, so radioactive isotopes, um, and we use those commonly in research. 
Um, another thing about um, elements is that elements can come at three different phases. They can be either solids, liquids, or gases, and this is generally going to be dependent on the temperature that surrounds them. So everything has what we call a freezing point and a boiling point. This is an atomic model. In an atomic model, we're looking at what's in the nucleus. Here's the proton in the nucleus. The electrons are on the outside. This is hydrogen. It's, it's generally unique. It does not have any of the neutrons. Um, here's helium. Helium has two protons and two neutrons and two electrons. These two are going to be the only ones that have this particular what we call valence shell. So let me talk about that for a second because as we get a little more complicated, we're going to see atoms that have another set of electron shells. So not just one, but two or maybe three or four, etc. electron shells. And basically the electron shells are going to be um, have a maximum capacity of electrons and the first electron shell can only take two. So for the first one, hydrogen is going to be reactive because it's going to want to meet its parameters where it wants to have two to have a full electron shell. Helium is going to be neutral because it only has two already and it doesn't need any more. Now as we talk about things like carbon and oxygen and how they interact with each other, we're going to be talking about valence electrons. And valence electrons are not the same thing as total electrons. So keep that in mind. The outermost shell of the electron's shells is called the valence shell. And that's the one that's interacting with the other atoms in the surroundings. Okay, but we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, so the nuclei have one role and the electrons have a different role. And they um, are very complementary roles in these atomic forces. So nuclei are going to be responsible for providing stability. They resist the external forces such as heat, energy, electricity. Um, Whereas electrons are much more dynamic. They um, capture and release energy constantly. They're in flow around the um, atomic nucleus constantly. And so that's going to be responsible for creating the bonds between one atom and another. And as I just mentioned, electrons are actually distributed around the nucleus, even though it's kind of a disordered pattern. They're distributed in, a, in an ordered, structured way. And they're distributed into these electron shells. So as you saw with hydrogen and helium, they only had that first electron shell. As I mentioned, the electron shell that's the very first shell wants two to be happy and satisfied. Now the second and outer electron shells, that's only for the purposes of this lecture, deal with carbon and oxygen right now. Um, the outer shell here wants to have eight. So this egg carton only holds two and this egg carton holds eight. And in order for the atom to be happy, it wants all of the eggs in the egg carton. So carbon has four and on that what we call valence shell, right, this outer shell here, and it wants to have eight. That means that it can make up to four bonds. And that's what's going to make it really unique because it's going to be the most versatile of all of the atoms in the terms of the amount of bonds that it can make because it can make four, which means that it can make four single bonds, it can make two double bonds, it can make one single bond and one triple bond, for example. Um, so it has a lot of options. Whereas oxygen here, in its valence shell, now keep in mind its, its number is eight, but in its valence shell it has six, right? Because that first shell takes away two. So you always have to subtract two from that number, that atomic number, to get to the amount of valence electrons. In this case, six. Six means in order to get to eight, it's reacting with two. So in order to fill this egg carton, it needs two eggs, which means it can eat, make either one double bond or two single bonds. And you can see why that constraint is a little more limiting than carbon, which has a lot more versatility. All right, so let's move forward. We'll talk about bonding a little bit later, um, but let's talk about electrons for a second. So electrons get kind of excited. They're excitable anyway, and they can take energy from their surroundings and pop up to a higher energy shell. And they can do this in repeatedly, right? Pick up energy, pop up, give off energy, pop down. Um, and when it releases the energy, again, it's going to fall back to its original shell. And this is going to be the dynamic of life, right? Life depends on these electrons capturing and releasing energy, right? And you can picture the use of a light bulb. So a light bulb is actually going to be a piece of, in the side there, there's a piece of metal that gets superheated. And the electrons that get passed through, the actual electricity that goes through that um, through that wire means that those electrons go rapidly from the outer shell to the original shell over and over, releasing the energy, capturing the energy, and it gets so hot that it starts to glow. Um, and that's how the light bulb actually works. So it works kind of like this. So we have um, energy that gets absorbed. It pops out to the higher energy shell. It releases the energy off in the form of light and then drops back down to its lower energy shell. Now, as I mentioned, every electron shell is going to hold a specific number of electrons. So we have multiple different sizes of egg cartons. That first shell that we talked about only holds two electrons, whereas the second shell holds eight. 
Um, and if it isn't even to 8, it wants to do one of two things. If it only has 1 in that outer shell, it wants to give it up to get down to 0 because that's also happy. So if it has 1, 2, or 3, it's going to want to release um, or perhaps share the electrons. If it has, for example, 7 or 8, 7 it's going to want to take 1 to make 8. If it's 8, it's neutral. And the electrons that are in the shell closest to the nucleus are going to fill first. So that first electron shell that I mentioned with 2 is always going to be filled up first. So you're always just going to want to subtract 2 from that atomic number to get to the amount of valence electrons that we're actually working with when we're talking about how atoms interact to make molecules. Now, molecules happen when more than one atom, so two or more atoms from either the same element or different elements, are going to come together based on the interactions of those electrons in those electron shells. Now let's talk about water, for example, because we're going to be talking about water extensively towards the end of the lecture. Um, and water is comprised of hydrogen and oxygen. We have two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule. You might recognize it as a Mickey Mouse molecule, and I'll talk about why. Or you'll see why in just a second. But basically, we've got two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Um, and another example of a molecule is something like sodium chloride, where we have sodium um, and one atom of chloride, so one item of sodium and one atom of chloride come together, um, and that's going to make table salt. Now, atoms are only going to react if they have an incomplete egg carton, right? An egg carton that's full is not going to cause any reactivity. So any atom that has an outer shell that is completely empty or completely full, either zero or eight, right, is going to be considered inert. Neon, for example, has eight electrons in the outermost shell. It's full, therefore it's inert. So it's not going to react, right? So neon walks into a bar and somebody tries to pick a fight and neon does not react. I know my jokes are terrible, but hopefully it'll help you remember that when it has a full electron shell, it has no reason to empty any out or pick any up because it's happy. Now, atoms are able to react based on the amount of electrons that are in that outer shell. So for example, oxygen that has six in its outermost electron shell can hold two more. So it's susceptible to reacting, and again, it can react in a couple of ways. It can do two single bonds, or it can do one double bond. So let's talk about the different types of bonds that we can make. Um, there are three separate types of chemical bonds. The two major types that we're going to talk about are going to be ionic bonds and covalent bonds. And that's basically whether or not atoms are transferring electrons from one to another or whether they are sharing electrons beneath, between one another. And then the third type is a hydrogen bond. And a hydrogen bond is going to be very specific to water itself um, or just to the hydrogen itself. And basically atoms are going to be looking to become more stable. So if an atom has an electron shell that has seven and wants eight, it's going to be looking to pick one up. If it has one, it's going to want zero, but they're looking to release one. Um, and these are called these different types of chemical bonds. Now if we look at hydrogen and oxygen in the water molecule, they're both going to gain stability because they interact with one another. So hydrogen only wants to make one bond, and oxygen wants to make two bonds. So oxygen is able to make two single bonds, one to each of the hydrogens. So hydrogen, one, has one double bond to oxygen. Hydrogen, two, has one double bond to oxygen. And oxygen has two double, or two single bonds. Let me just back that up. Let me just see if we can move forward here. I feel like I've lost you. Find water, and then let's talk. All right, here. Um, so this is what water looks like. So here we have oxygen. Oxygen is a larger molecule than hydrogen. Hydrogen, as you might remember, only has one in its valence shell. And its valence shell is a little bit of a smaller egg carton than oxygen. So it only wants two, right? It has one and it wants two. So it's reactive, it's able to make one bond because it has one and it wants two. Oxygen, on the other hand, has six and it wants eight because it's got that second valence shell which is a little bit larger and holds eight instead of two like that or inner shell. That means that it's able to make two bonds, one with hydrogen, one here, and one there. In that way, oxygen is able to make two single bonds, and each hydrogen is also able to make one single bond, so it's stable. But what's interesting about this, and we'll get back to this when we talk about um, water specifically, but what's interesting about this is that because oxygen is a larger molecule, I'm sorry, is a larger atom in this water molecule, the electron that's shared between hydrogen and oxygen is going to spend longer in oxygen's care than it is in hydrogen's. 
And that means, see how if you were, pretend that you were an electron and you had to orbit this versus orbiting that, right? It takes a little bit longer to go around this than it does to go around that. So this is going to be partially negative. It takes the electron for a little bit longer than the electron is going to be shared here with the hydrogen is going to travel a little bit further. That's going to give what's called partial charges. So this is a partial negative charge and a partial positive charge, um, which is going to lend itself to the ability of water to bond with another water molecule. But I digress. I just wanted to kind of demonstrate what was happening there when we were talking about different types of bonds. So let me go back again to where we were. Um, so we can have two different types of bonds. Here we go. Let's talk about ionic bonding first. Um, the ion ionic bonds are going to happen when the egg cartons are almost full or almost empty. So they're going to happen on the various, like the very left and the very right of the periodic table are going to come together. So atoms that are able to lose or gain electrons are going to become charged, and that's going to make them called ions. So, for example, an atom that has lost an electron becomes positively charged, like sodium, like that bad joke I told earlier. Atoms that have gained electrons are going to become negatively charged, like chlorine. So sodium has a positive charge, chlorine has a negative charge, they're going to get attracted to one another, and they're going to be bound by an ionic bond. And this is what I meant when I said that one of them had only one in its outer egg carton. So here's a neutral sodium atom, which has one extra electron around it. So it's going to transfer that over so it can get down to having no eggs in its egg carton over to the chlorine atom, which is the exact opposite. It has seven eggs in the egg carton that wants eight. So seven electrons. That means this electron is going to get transferred over from the sodium atom to the chlorine atom, making a sodium ion and a chloride ion. And because those have positive and negative charges, they're going to attract one another. This is actually going to make a really nice crystalline structure. So the negative charge is going to attract directly to the positive charge. And so you're going to see a nice lattice. This is why table salt forms a nice crystal. That's considered an ionic bond. So an ionic bond is the equivalent of transferring an electron, not permanently, but for a longer period of time than something like a covalent bond where an electron is shared. So that means that the electron is actually going to be bouncing back and forth between the two atoms in the molecule. So an atom that has a partially full egg carton can become stable by sharing its eggs with another atom, right? So you can share electrons between these two atoms, and that's going to form a covalent bond. Covalent bonds can be found in something like H2, in which one hydrogen is bound to another hydrogen. That's a single bond. Between two oxygen molecules, as you remember, oxygen has six and wants eight, so it's going to make two bonds. It's going to be in the form of a double bond here if we have two oxygens together. Nitrogen is going to be able to make three bonds, so it can do one of two things, uh, one of three things, I guess. It can have three single bonds to different atoms, or in the case of N2, it has one triple bond between two nitrogen molecules. Um, and then it could also have a double bond and a single bond to a different atom, for example. Uh, another example of a covalent bond is going to be found in water, so H2O. And as I mentioned, sometimes in a covalent bond, we're not going to be sharing that electron as equally as other times. Now, covalent bonds are overall going to be stronger than ionic bonds, but they vary in their stability. So as I mentioned, a single bond won't be as strong as a double bond, which won't be as strong as a triple bond. Um, so covalent bonds are going to vary in their stability, but they are generally going to be stronger than ionic bonds, particularly in an aqueous solution. And we'll talk about how water disrupts ionic bonds in just a little bit. But if you figure that we have those partial positive and partial negative charges that I was talking about earlier in that um, unequal distribution of the electrons in the water molecule, that means that the partial positive charges can gang up and become the equivalent of one positive charge, and the partial negative charges can do the same and become the equivalent of one full negative charge. And in that way, they can disrupt an ionic bond. So this is what I was just mentioning. So biological molecules have to function in an environment that's generally a watery environment. So ionic bonds aren't going to last very well here. They're going to break down very quickly. And so most of the bonds that we're going to be talking about in our biological molecules, like proteins, sugars, and fats, and that's going to be in its own chapter, um, but they're going to be held together by covalent bonds mainly. All right, so this is talking about multiple different atoms that we use that are found anyway in uh, biological systems, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur. And um, again, we're going to be talking about the outer electron shell, which is different for hydrogen than any of the rest of them because the hydrogen only has the first shell, which has a full, um, is full with two electrons. The others are going to want to hold eight. 
So remember that first egg carton only holds two. The next egg cartons out, for at least the purposes of this class, are going to hold eight. And that means that carbon is going to have um, four electrons in its outer shell, and it wants to hold eight. It's going to be able to make four separate covalent bonds. And there's a way that it can combine that. It can do four individual single bonds. It can do two double bonds. It can do one triple and one single bond. So you can see it has a lot more versatility than some of the other atoms. Nitrogen, for example, again, it has eight. Or it wants eight. It has five. That means it can make three. It can do either three single or it can do um, one double and one single or it can do one triple. Oxygen um, has six and one, wants eight. That means it can form two. It can do that either by one double or two single. Sulfur is kind of the same thing, um, except it's going to have one extra ring around it. I won't be asking you anything tricky like that for the exams, I promise. But what I'd like you to understand is the amount of electrons that are available in that outer shell, which is basically the atomic number minus two, with the exception of hydrogen, because hydrogen is working on a different level of valence, um, valence shells. And then you're going to take that and subtract it from eight. So if it has four and it wants eight, it's going to make four. If it has five and it wants eight, it's going to make three. If it has six and it wants eight, it's going to make two. Does that make sense? Um, so that's where we are in terms of how atoms are going to be bonding to one another in order to make molecules. Now the atoms within a molecule might have different nuclear charges, right? Positive or negative charges. And that might have a, more of a positive nuclear charge pulling more um, on electrons with a covalent bond, for example. So we might end up with different bonds that um, are going to be a little bit more equally shared or less equally shared. And that brings us to what we talked about with water in that the electrons in water are not equally shared, right? In water, the electrons are going to take a longer time orbiting the oxygen than they do the smaller hydrogen, and so therefore they're going to be unequally shared. And an unequally shared covalent bond is called a polar covalent bond. And the way that I remember this is that polar bears sit on ice, and ice is made of water, and water is a polar molecule. So it's pretty simple, just kind of, I know it's a silly thing to remember, but just go with polar bears sitting on an ice. Um, flow and the ice is made of water and water is a polar molecule. Now a nonpolar covalent bond would be when we were able to have an equal sharing of the electrons between the two atoms. Now an example of this would be a double bond, a single bond between two hydrogen molecules or a double bond between two oxygen molecules, right? Anytime that the electrons are shared equally it's what we call nonpolar. Now, a molecule has a lot of different bonds in it, and not all bonds are going to be created equal, right? So it may have some polar bonds and some nonpolar bonds, um, and it's a larger molecule. And we'll talk about that when we get to something like plasma membranes, which have polar regions and nonpolar regions. So larger molecules can have sections that are polar and sections that are not polar, um, but generally a molecule that has polar bonds is going to be considered a polar molecule overall. Um, and water is the classic example of a polar molecule. There's a slightly positive charge pull around each of the hydrogens. Again, the electron doesn't spend as long around the hydrogen, therefore giving it a slight positive charge because the electron is negative, right? And the oxygen is going to hoard that electron for a little bit longer, so it's going to get a little bit more of a negative charge. So that's depicted as a slight positive charge on the hydrogen and a slight negative charge on the oxygen, which means that there's a little bit of promiscuity in the way that this atom or this molecule is going to interact with the atoms of other molecules around it because, again, these slightly negative charges can combine into a full-on negative charge, and the slightly positive charges can combine, depending on how the molecules align themselves, to give a full positive charge, which can easily disrupt ionic bonds. Okay, so this is the depiction that I showed earlier, so I'm just going to kind of gloss over it, but this is water. As I mentioned, it looks kind of like Mickey Mouse, in this case upside down. Oxygen is larger than hydrogen. Um, and the other major difference is that oxygen has that second valence, that second shell, which means that its outer shell or valence shell is going to want eight, whereas hydrogen is smaller and it only has the valence shell that wants two, which means that the electrons are not going to spend as long on the hydrogen atoms as they do on the oxygen atoms, giving water a slight negative charge on the oxygen side and a slight positive charge on the hydrogen side, which makes it a polar molecule and it's polar covalent bonding.
This is an example of nonpolar covalent bonding, as I mentioned, with hydrogen. If hydrogen wa has one and it wants two in its valence shell, and it shares one amongst each other, and it shares it evenly because it's going to spend the same amount of time going around this one as that one, then we're going to end up with a nonpolar covalent bond. And a good example of that, again, would be hydrogen gas. Okay, so let's talk about free radicals for a little bit. Free radicals are very disruptive. So anything that is uh, basically a molecule where we have atoms that have unpaired electrons on their outer shells, um, they're very unstable. They react very quickly with other molecules, basically by stealing their electrons, which destroys other molecules. And I like to make this uh, example, and I know it's kind of outdated because nobody brings pencils to class anymore since everything is online, um, but if you pictured a bunch of students that came to class with pen and paper, and one student shows up without a pen or pencil. And because they want to take notes, they look around and quickly, sneakily grab the pencil of the person next to them and then continue to take notes. But that turns the person next to them into a student which doesn't have a pencil, and that student then grabs a pencil from the student next to them. Pretty soon you have an all-out war of war pencils where everyone is grabbing one pencil from another and no one is taking notes and the productivity of the class has reached zero. And that's what free radicals basically do. They can induce cell death by making a cascade whereby every molecule is pulling an electron from the molecule right next to it, destroying the molecules themselves in the process. Okay, so if we have a polar molecule like water, we're going to have charges on one side that's opposite of the other, partial charges, right? And these partial charges, as I mentioned, although they are slight, they are additive. So what that means is that you have multiple sets of water molecules that can add up, right? And also they can attract each other. So hydrogen bonding is our third type of bonding when we are talking about partial opposite charges. Now, to be very clear here, a hydrogen bond is not occurring in the same water molecule. It is occurring between water molecule A and water molecule B. Basically, what happens is one molecule that extends its partial positive side and the other molecule extends its partial negative side, and those two are attracted to create a hydrogen bond. And we can form a whole chain of these hydrogen bonds on water. Um, and and often sometimes within the same molecule, not within the same water molecule, but in a much longer biomolecule, for example, we might have a region that has one set of um, partial positive and another that's partial negative that induce something to fold. Proteins, for example, are often held together in different regions by hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonds are comparatively weak if you compare them back to an ionic bond or a covalent bond. Um, however, collectively they can be quite strong. And this is what allows something like a, a water strider to run across the surface of a pond because all of these water molecules, again, picture each Mickey Mouse as one oxygen and two hydrogen, right? One oxygen and two hydrogen. And each of the oxygen hoards the electron for a little bit longer than the hydrogen, which means that it gets a little bit more of a negative charge than the hydrogen. So this partial negative charge from this oxygen molecule A interacts with this partial positive charge from this hydrogen on molecule B, creating these hydrogen bonds. And collectively, if you look at all of these water molecules together, this is how we get surface tension, for example, or what we call capillary action. This is how the water gets dragged all the way from the roots up to the very tippy, tippy top of the tallest trees. And that's by what we call cohesion, right? We just talked about this attraction between water molecules, and that is what allows them to stick together to pull themselves up to the very top of the tree, for example, or if you ever were to put a paper towel or a piece of toilet paper in a glass of water, it's not just what's in the water that gets wet, the water actually pulls quite quickly up the paper towel, um, and that's because we have this cohesion amongst two water molecules and three water molecules and a whole chain of water molecules that pulls them along to wherever the direction the first one is headed. And that's also what allows us to create surface tension on the top of the water. Certain things might sit on the top of the water. If you drop a, a feather, for example, it might sit on the surface of the water. Certain spiders and also a water strider actually rely on that surface tension to be able to stealthily move across the surface of the pond, something like this. Here's our um, water strider here, uh, and here is the very, very tippy top of the treetops are still going to get water because the water is going to be pulled up kind of like a straw from the molecules that are in a long chain going all the way up the trunk of the tree. Now, let's take a break about talking about how water works, well, um, and let's talk about it as a solvent.
So water actually is going to be the universal solution, right? Universal solvent, I mean, and making a lot of different solutions. So most of the solutions in our body are actually going to be water soluble. So a lot of different things are going to dissolve in water and the, the term for dissolve is basically when something is completely surrounded and dispersed. So for example, a, a spoonful of sugar in a glass of water or a spoonful of salt in a glass of water would dissolve, but a tablespoon of sand would not dissolve. And this is what I meant when I said that the charges were additive. So if you look at, here's our sodium chloride, that beautiful crystal of table salt that I showed you earlier, um, with the negative charge on the chloride and this positive charge um, on the sodium that are going to uh, have this um, positive negative interaction that allow it to have a beautiful crystalline shape, it's actually going to be easily disrupted by the additive charge of all of the partial positives of the hydrogens and all of the partial negatives of the oxygens. And you can see that that aligns so that the oxygen is going to have a partial negative charge. We have a full positive charge of the sodium. Here, let's, let's look here, full po positive charge of the sodium and three partial negatives from the oxygen is going to be enough to pull that sodium away from its dance partner. And same thing over here, we're going to have the partial, um, partial positive charges of the hydrogen interacting with the negative charge, which is going to pull this one apart as well. And that's how things are going to dissolve into water, is that what we previously had in terms of ionic bonds, like this crystalline structure of table salt, is going to be broken up and disrupted by the additive nature of all of these partial positive and partial negative charges because of polar bonding and hydrogen bonding. Alright, so anything that's able to be soluble in water is going to be considered hydrophilic. So anything that we just talked about that's able to dissolve into water, like salt and sugar, those are considered hydrophilic molecules. Basically, they're molecules that are attracted to the ions or different polar molecules um, and therefore can dissolve, things like sugar and amino acids, can dissolve into the water solution. Insoluble molecules Water insoluble molecules, I apologize, those are called hydrophobic. Um, hydro being water and phobic being fearing, previously philic being loving. So hydrophilic would be water loving, hydrophobic would be water fearing. Um, and an example of that would be the hydrophobic interaction that you see with fats and oils on the surface of water, like um, here we would have oil and water, right? Classic hydrophobic interaction. One of the most important things um, of water is that water is helped able to help moderate temperature changes inside an organism because it takes a lot of energy to heat water um, and also a lot of energy to evaporate water. So the evaporation of water is actually a cooling process. So when the um, evaporation of water takes a lot of energy, that's actually going to cool the individual down with something like sweating. Um, and it's very important that, again, you're going to hear the word homeostasis a lot throughout this semester, but that we maintain our temperature homeostasis because if we get out of that temperature range, very low or very high temperatures, we can end up slowing down or damaging specifically important chemical reactions in our body that could do things like denature our enzymes or um, lead to metabolic death, basically. So we have to make sure that we stay within a specific temperature range, and water is going to help mediate that because it's going to have a very high what we call specific heat. Um, it takes a lot of energy to heat water up and the specific heat is defined as the amount of energy required to heat one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. And that's actually aligned to what, how long it takes or the specific heat of water. Now, when we look at something called a calorie, which is how we talk about energy and energy expenditure, um, we look at calories, and that's defined as the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius, which is the specific heat of water. And again, that's going to be a very slow process compared to other molecules. And when we think about temperature, we just think about a number on a scale, right, on a thermometer, but temperature actually reflects the speed of molecular motion. If you think of something like a solid being so hard, that's because the molecules don't move against each other, and a liquid being fluid because the molecules are able to do so, and then a gas being that the molecules are bouncing off of each other so much that it turns into, say, water vapor. So temperature is directly reflective of the speed of the molecular motion. Um, one of the other technical terms that we're going to use is the word, the phrase heat of vaporization. And heat of vaporization is just defined as the amount of heat that is necessary in order to change a substance um, from a liquid to a gas, right? So how much heat you need to take water and make it water vapor. 
And when water evaporates, that actually consumes heat from its surroundings because it's a heat intensive um, process and that's actually going to cool the nearby environment. And this is why sweating actually cools the individual. So even though you're getting water lost to your body, you're actually helping to maintain your body temperature. And the human body actually has a lot of water in it. It's mostly water. So someone that's laying out in the sunshine who is actually in a much higher temperature is able to absorb a lot of that heat energy because of the water water's ability to kind of absorb it without sending his, his or her body temperature soaring. So here's just an example of sun beaters being protected by the high specific heat of water. Another interesting thing about water is that water forms a very unusual solid that's known as ice. So most substances are going to become denser when they solidify from a liquid into a solid, so they would actually sink in their, uh, so the solid version of the substance should sink within the liquid version, but ice is unusual because it's actually less dense than liquid water, and so it's actually going to float on top of the liquid water. And that is because water molecules turn into a crystalline structure. They spread slightly apart when they freeze. And that looks kind of like this. So this is liquid water with all the water molecules just kind of sliding against each other willy-nilly. And then when water freezes into ice, it makes a nice crystalline pattern. It actually pops out, and there's space in between. And this is why you, when you put something into the freezer, for example, in a particular restrained glass bottle, it might break that bottle. If you try to freeze a bottle of water, for example, it might break it or distend it. And that's because ice is actually going to pop out from the liquid water and actually make a, um, a more crystalline structure. And this is super beneficial for all organisms that live in ponds and lakes. So as I mentioned, ice is going to float on liquid water, so it's unusual in that way. And what that means is that as they freeze, from the top down, right, a pond or a lake is going to freeze from the top down, it can never actually freeze all the way at the bottom because even though the temperatures reach freezing and sometimes below, they can never have the space for it to pop into that three-dimensional structure. And therefore, simply because of pressure of all the ice above it, it has to stay in the liquid water state. And this is just showing you someone who is ice fishing and taking advantage of the fact that even though there is ice on the surface, there is liquid water underneath the bottom. All right, so we're going to kind of shift gears here for a second, and we're going to talk about pH. And anything that is a solution that is water-based can be either acidic, which means it has a low pH, it can be basic, which means it has a high pH, or it can be neutral, which means it has a pH approximately 7. So uh, the pH scale is going to run from 0 to 14. Um, and zero, we have 0 and 1 being very acidic, 14 being very basic, and neutral being somewhere around 7. Now, if you remember that I talked about water being comprised of two hydrogen, molecules, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, then I want to demonstrate that water can actually break into a free hydrogen ion and a hydroxyl ion. Hydroxyl. And so this OH group is going to be at negative because it is still going to carry that oxygen, which is going to have a partial negative. This hydrogen is going to be positive. Now, if we have more hydrogen ions in solution than we do OH groups, right, hydroxyl groups, then we're going to be acidic. And if the opposite is true, then we're going to be basic. So what are we doing when we talk about pH? We are talking about the ratio of the hydrogen ion and the hydroxyl group, which are going to have come off of a water molecule that has been split in half. So it can split into OH and H. The OH is negative, the H is positive, and when we look at the ratio of them, we're going to end up with either free hydrogen ions in solution, right, or less hydrogen ions in solution. So something like hydrochloric acid, for example, could provide the hydrogen ion without providing the OH group. So now we're going to add with an increase of hydrogen ions, so we have more H than we do OH, and that's going to be considered an acid, right? We have multiple naturally occurring acids like lemon juice and vinegar, and we're also going to have multiple naturally occurring bases as well. Things like baking soda and chlorine, bleach, and ammonia are going to be basic. Now, the reason something would be basic would be if we had a higher concentration of OH, which is negative, then we do hydrogen ions. And that could happen if we had an increase of something like sodium hydroxide, which would add um, the OH negative, but does not add any of the hyd uh, hydrogen ions. And so therefore, we'd end up with an increase of, in OH 
as compared to the concentration of H. And so that's really all it is. It's just the ratio of the OH molecules and the H molecules. If we have more OH, they're basic. If we have more hydrogen, it's acidic. And if it's even, then we're neutral, or even-ish, then we're neutral. Okay, so water is always going to be broken down back and forth between liquid water and the ionized version of the hydroxide ion, um, which is uh, also considered a hydroxyl group if you put it onto some other molecule, um, and the hydrogen ion. So it's a ratio between the hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions. Now, if we have more of the hydrogen ions than we do the hydroxide ions, we have a pH of 0 to 6, so that's going to be acidic. And this number is going to be how far off this scale is. So how many more, and it's a logarithmic scale, so it's going to be groups of 10 more, tenfold more every time you go down. pH of neutral is about 7. It's going to be when we have approximately the same amount of um, the H and the OH. And pH of 8 to 14 is going to be basic. Basically, we have more OH than we have H. All right, here's an overview of the pH scale of some things that you might be able to find in your own house that have relative pHs. Um, so something in the pH value of 6 to 8 is going to be considered neutral-ish, things like milk, water, blood, sweat. You'll see most of our bodily fluids are actually found in here. There are some exceptions, though. We do get more acidic as we talk about things like urine. Um, urine's actually going to be in the 5.7 range. So actually, we have some regions of our body that do have more acidic things. Something like, for example, stomach juice is actually about 2.3, so it's very acidic. I'm sorry, stomach acid is about 2. Um, it's, it's, it's more acidic than, say, lemon juice. So different regions of our body do produce fluids that are at variable pHs, but most of the body fluids are going to be found somewhere in the region of 6 to 8. Some other things you might recognize as we get more increasingly acidic, things like lemon juice, as I mentioned, soda, vinegar, orange juice, which would be citric acid, just a different amount than, say, a lemon, um, beer, tomato, black coffee. That's why people put cream in the coffee to help neutralize the acidity of the coffee. On the other side of the basic scale, things like antacids, right, like Tums. And why do we take Tums? Oh, our stomach is upset. Oh, our stomach is upset because of the stomach acid. So we'll neutralize it with an antacid. And then as we get further, we get into our cleaners because these are going to be more reactive with other molecules, which means they might be better at scouring your pans for example. All right, so as I mentioned, inside our body, we want to have a pretty constant pH, and so we're going to need something called a buffer. And a buffer is a specific type of molecule that's going to help the solution maintain a constant pH. Buffers are responsible for accepting or releasing hydrogen ions if we end up with a change in pH. So it's going to notice the amount of free hydrogen ions in solution and either accept if we have too many or release some from a compound that it already, or a region of the molecule in order to um, help offset it if we have too few. An example of a buffer is the bicarbonate buffer and that's found in our bloodstream and that's one of the main reasons that we can prevent major changes to the pH of our bloodstream. So for example, if the blood ends up becoming too acidic, right, it's too acidic because we have too much free hydrogen ions in solution. So therefore, we're going to want to absorb that hydrogen ion. So we take bicarbonate, and it's going to meet that hydrogen ion, and it's going to absorb that hydrogen ion to make carbonic acid, therefore removing the hydrogen ion from the bloodstream and returning our, our blood back to a more neutral pH. However, if the blood goes the other way, right, if our blood becomes too basic, that means that we don't have an we have more of the OH groups and not enough of the hydrogen ions, then the um, carbonic acid is going to free the hydrogen ions in order to be able to combine with those OH groups, right, so that we can form water. So that hydroxide ion is going to be what causes the, right, the, it's the concentration of the hydroxide ion to the hydrogen ion. And so if we are going to be able to release a hydrogen ion here from carbonic acid, that's going to make it bicarbonate. That free hydrogen is going to bond with the hydroxide ion to make water. And that's going to remove the hydroxide ion from solution, which is going to, again, help us restore a neutral pH. All right. So that brings us to the end of our lecture here today. I appreciate you coming all the way to the end. Um, thank you very much, and I hope you have a fantastic day. Happy studying.